Hey everybody, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, and it's episode number 258 of Goulet Q&A. And uh, I'm gonna be taking off next week. I'll go ahead and give you a heads up. I got three days off. My daughter is getting a very minor surgery. Uh, she is seven. We're a little nervous about that, but uh, I won't get into all the details, but uh, she's gonna be just fine. We're not like super nervous or anything, but I'm gonna take off a good portion of the week next week to tend to my family. So that's what's happening. No Q&A next week. I apologize about that, but uh, I'm gonna try and make it up for you and give you an awesome one today, shall we? Um, so this episode, I'm gonna be talking about nib tipping alloys, Noodler's Charlie pens, and the Goulet bottom shelf and what that's all about. So I hope you enjoy this one. Uh, things that have been up to in the last week. So we went up to Rachel's parents' place this past weekend. We had our niece and nephew's birthday party to go to. They were born a very close time. So their parents just did a joint party while they're really young. That makes a lot of sense. Wish Rachel and I had thought of that when our kids were younger. <laughs> now we're past that point. They gotta be separate birthdays. Uh, but anyway, so it was a good time. Got to see lots of family and get to hang out with kids and all their young little friends. And we were just like, our kids were the old ones at this party. And we were like, yeah, our children are not toddlers, clearly. So anyway, that was kind of fun. Um, and I got to ride my bike on an extended ride on the W and OD trail, which if you're familiar with the DC area, you may know what that is. But basically it was like a 45 mile stretch of railroad that they paved and turned into basically a park. Um, so it's like the longest, skinniest park in the state. <laughs> it's this 45 mile park that's maybe 10 feet wide, uh, but it's pretty interesting. So it's pretty cool though. You know, you just get to ride and ride and ride and ride and ride. And there were tons of people out there because it was gorgeous. So that was awesome. Got to get my good biking in. I've been doing that a lot more, trying to get the weight down a little bit, watching what I eat a little better because I'm a bit heavier than I want to be. So I'm kind of back on that horse. That's how it goes. Um, we've had a ton of IT issues around the Goulet Pen Shop. I won't get too much into it, but it's been crazy. Like Verizon was down on most of the East Coast. So our internet service was spotty. We had to use Comcast instead. And then we've had server issues. We've had individual computers dying on people and just, it's really been a week. We've had HVAC issues, all completely like separate, not necessarily related to each other, but it's just been like whack-a-mole here. That's how it goes sometimes, and especially when you're an online business. Things like computers and internet service are pretty darn important. So I've been focusing on that kind of stuff. Uh, Product-wise, we've had some interesting stuff coming in in the last week or so. Uh, we had this come in. I did not mention it, but we launched it on Friday. This is Jacques-Herbon, excuse me, uh, 1798 Kainite du Nepal. And uh, so this is the newest edition. They've been coming out with these every year or two. Uh, and this is the latest one. So this is a blue with a silver shimmer in it, which looks awesome. And if you weren't aware, the 1670 ink series has gold shimmer in it and the 1798 has blue shimmer to it. So uh, it looks really, really good. Uh, I think in general, there are more shimmering inks and stuff out there than there used to be. So this one hasn't been like a, oh my gosh, this is the most unique thing ever in the world. But the way I think I will say about the, the Jacques Urban inks is they are really good performers and they tend to um, clog your pens less than maybe some of the other ones. I don't know if it's like the, how fine the particulate is, um, but it tends to be a pretty, pretty solid performer and it looks, looks really nice. And this particular color is like this blue turquoise kind of color. I mean, of course I'm a fan of blue. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a really good color. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, I do think this one is worth a look. And if you're using, especially on something like Tomoe, like I have here, it's going to show rather nicely. Uh, what else have I got here? So I have, uh, the Banu Supreme, which is cool because Banu mostly has number five nibs on their pens and these have number six nibs. So we've been interested in carrying more Banus that have number six nibs because we like number six nibs, they're a little bit bigger. You can actually swap them with other ones. Um, they're using Schmidt nibs, which I don't know whether that's Bach or Yovo making them, uh, but either way, they're German made nibs, nice performing. I just did the nib nook for the Supreme and uh, I was very pleased. So it's very familiar kind of feeling these, these German made number six nibs. Um, but we have two different models are two different colors, I guess I should say. This is the Nebula, which looks really cool. It's this black kind of sparkly. It's meant to emulate space. And then it's got this, well, it looks pretty much like a space nebula in here. I'm gonna try to zoom in a little bit and show you what's going on, but really cool coloration. And it, it's like, how in the world did they do that? How did they cast this? 
Well, there's actually a very involved process for how this happens. It involves a lot of hand painting with many, many layers. Uh, and so Drew and I, we got some detailed information from them about how they actually make these pens. Uh, and we plan on sharing those in right now next week. So we'll dive into that a little bit. And then this is the other one. This is called Symphony. Uh, and it's uh, obviously a very different color theme, but uh, still kind of the same thing, the hand-painted kind of look. Looks really, really interesting. Just Banu comes up with some of the craziest stuff, and it's very fascinating. Um, not super, super cheap, because you're talking about 170 and 200, but when you understand a little bit more about how they have to make them, it might make you appreciate it at least just a little bit more. So anyway, we'll get into more details on that, hopefully on Monday if all goes to plan. Uh, and then Opus 88 just recently came out with their Omar in a clear, which is the Omar is a relatively new model of pen. They've got a couple different colors there. They've got a you know a, like a bronze and a burgundy and a green and stuff. So um, you may think that it looks kind of like the uh, demonstrator that we've had, the Opus 88 demonstrator, and it looks very similar. It's very similar in size. Number six, Yovo nib, uh, same eyedropper, so the ink capacity and everything is very similar. Uh, the trim is maybe just a little bit more pronounced. The clip's a little wider. The trim rings are a little fatter, so that black, matte black trim pops out just a little bit more. Uh, and then it's obviously much more rounded. But overall, the size and feel of it is going to be good, and it is postable. So um, the regular uh, demonstrator is not postable. It like, can sort of not fit on the end, but then it doesn't stay there. Uh, this one is more postable, which is really kind of nice. The Omar's, I mean, it's not like the most solid post of all pens probably, um, and it's a pretty big pen as it is, but if you push it on here and then just give it a little bit of a tug, it'll grab onto there and you'll be able to write with it. It's pretty back heavy if you do that, but it is possible. So if that was a kind of a deal breaker for you on the other version, you now have this uh, available to you on this version. And then another thing that we got that came in this week is the Twisby Clear Go. So the Twisby Go has been available in a black and a blue translucent demonstrator. It's Twisby's most affordable pen at $18.99, and they are pretty fun pens. Uh, they, you know, they, they look a little more adolescent, I guess you could say. Uh, and some people aren't necessarily loving the like kind of cloudy looking grip on it. Uh, that's one thing that I kind of hear as a criticism, but to me, I don't, it doesn't bother me at all. Um, I think it's awesome because it's got this sweet piston on the back. It's just a spring piston, push piston, very simple mechanism. That's why Twisby can make it so affordably. And actually this style of plastic is extremely durable. So uh, you're not gonna have to worry about cracking or any of that kind of stuff because it's, uh, it's just a knock around pen. So you're still getting the same Yovo nibs. This is the same nib as what you see on the Classic as well as the Eco. Uh, so if you're familiar with that at all, you can actually yank these nibs out if you are so inclined. The fins on the feed are a little delicate, but you can pull the nibs out. You can swap them between those pens if you're so inclined. Um, just if you ruin it, don't, don't, don't tell Twisby that I told you to, to do that. Uh, you just have to do it at your own risk, but it looks, uh, it looks pretty cool. It's a cool pen. Does this go back in a certain way? Let's see. I haven't yanked one of the, I haven't yanked it on on this pen before. Okay, there we go. So um, there's the Go. Pretty cool pen. Pretty decent ink capacity and very affordable. So it's a great pen, especially for kids, um, or if you just want to have you know high ink capacity with. Uh, as many pens as possible. That one's a good one to look into. Uh, extra fine through broad nibs available on that. And then we launched another kind of cool thing this week, um, the Jacques Urbain line. So this is ink, stationary, and glass pens. Rachel and I talked about it in right now yesterday, so I won't go into great detail about it. You can check out that video we did there. Um, but we are the um, you know exclusive retailer in the U.S. for this new Jacques Urbain line. It's kind of their premium line, um, and they are kind of you know crawling, walking, running into that. There's some pens that are, might be coming down the pike. Uh, and other things that they are, are interesting uh, that they're coming out with. So uh, Jacques is actually, uh, or Urban is, is, you know, basically our oldest brand. The whole family of Clairefontaine, Rodia, Quivatis, um, Jacques Urban, that's all. It used to be called J. Urban. They split it out to now just Urban in the regular line, and then Jacques Urban is now their kind of premium line. So um, that's pretty cool. So we're pumped and honored to, after 10 years now of working with them nearly, uh, to be able to, to do that with them is pretty cool. And then lastly, we have um, the Colorverse Apollo, or sorry, the Colorverse, um, what's it called? First Moon Landing. 
Uh, I think it's what, yeah, first moon landing set. Uh, it's a hundred dollar set, has five different inks, one big one, four little ones that are all themed around the Apollo 11 mission and the first landing on the moon. So it's, uh, the inks are Apollo 11, Tranquility Base, Columbia, One Small Step, and Eagle. Uh, and they're all different colors. I don't have swaths of them yet because as of the shooting of this video, I don't have the inks in yet, but I think it'll be launched by the time this video publishes. So you can check that out if you're interested. We're not, I don't know how many we're gonna get, um, but it's gonna be kind of a limited thing, I think. Um, and then something interesting that we had <laughs> that I mentioned to you last week, we had some custom ground Homo sapiens with uh, Mark Bacchus's Cursive Smooth Italic. Um, and I mentioned and they were like, yeah, we might still have them. No, we totally didn't. <laughs> Have them. I think we sold most of them uh, almost by the time I was done the recording of the video uh, last week. So uh, that was, you know, sold a little faster than what I expected. So I apologize if I got you excited about them. You saw in Q&A and then you went there and you're like, what the heck, where are they? They disappeared. Well, that's because they all sold out. So we are working to get more of them. We were wanting to do more. We just got to get restocked. So it's going to take us a little while. We got to buy a stock of them because we have to get a very specific nib size that that Mark starts with, but we're gonna get him more. I've talked to him and it was like, hey, this was really successful. Can we do some more? You know, Coles of London, Visconti's distributor, seems pretty happy with the response as well. So we are in the process of coordinating more. So if you're interested, be on the lookout. We're gonna have them, uh, you know, available in the next few weeks. It all depends on how quickly Mark is able to do them and how much we can coordinate and all that kind of stuff. But um, we're going to look to probably do both medium and broad cursive italics this go around because we are having some stock issues on some of the, the mediums. So we are probably going to do a little bit of both. Uh, so we will see how it goes. But it's going to be kind of stop and start with these. It's not, you know, an endless supply of these things ready to go. We're trying to coordinate a lot that happens. So I appreciate your patience on that. Um, then we got a lot of just sales going on in general, you know, so just keep checking our site, sign up for email newsletter. Um, we have a lot of things that are kind of going on and we're gonna have some interesting stuff uh, starting next week as well. So be on the lookout. Okay, let's get into questions for this week, shall we? Starting out with pen and writing questions, we have a shoota shoot car on Twitter. Why is there a price difference between the music nib and other nibs of the Platinum 3776 Century? You've been to the Platinum factory while touring in Japan. You can definitely shed some light on it. Um, sure. So I have the Platinum 3776 Century in Borgogna with a music nib, right? So the music nib, why is the music nib any different? For those of you that don't know, at least Platinum's music nib, there's a couple different brands that have a music nib. Um, but Platinum's specifically, it's kind of a special nib because it has three tines. So it has two cuts. I'm gonna see how close I can get here. Um, it has two cuts, two slits, um, that make a three-tined nib. And it basically acts like a stub. So the tipping material is pretty wide. It's wider on the cross, wider on the downstroke, thinner on the cross stroke, just like a stub nib would be. But they grind this one in such a way uh, that it's a little bit different than just a regular stub. A regular stub is made to be held kind of more at a 45 degree angle and it's made so that that gives you most of your line variation. This actually has most of your line variation when it's held more at a 90 degree angle. Now why would that matter necessarily? Well if you are an actual musician and you are playing with your music up on a piano or maybe on a music stand or something, it's held at a much more upright angle and if you're trying to write your approach towards the page is much more upright than it is at a 45, like as if you have a page laying down on a desk. So with it, you know, if you think about it, if you're taking and you're rotating it up, you know, you're still gonna have it in front of you, but it's gonna be kind of a little more head on. So they grind the nib so that you're getting more of that variation because when you're writing music, you want, you know, you want some of that line variation to be able to do thinner stems and things like that on the, the music notes, but then the flags and, you know, the, the other parts of the, the notes can be a little bit thicker. Uh, and so uh, that's why they do it that way. So it's kind of an interesting nib. Not a lot of brands have a music nib. Most of them just go with a conventional stub. Um, but it's a very specific kind of grind. And um, it's a little bit more work because you have to cut those slits basically perfectly. And there's twice as much that you could screw up. Uh, so I imagine their waste and scrap and rework is higher on these nibs. Um, the tipping material is greater and the shaping and just the, the handwork that's involved 
in forming the tip and getting it to flow and work properly on a nib like this is just much more complex because you have multiple slits. So uh, that's basically why it's more expensive. It's pretty much just time. Um, the materials itself is probably negligible difference. Maybe the tipping is a little bit more expensive with a giant blob like that, um, but it's probably not a super meaningful amount. It's, it's probably pretty much labor uh, that you're paying for as the difference there. So, you know, it's a pretty specific use. It's not necessarily a nib that everyone is going to take to. Um, but if you do hold it at more of an upright angle and you want that stub feel, or especially if you're using it for actual music writing, I don't think that's the situation for most people who are buying this pen, but um, that can certainly can be used for that. Uh, I think that's what it is. It's pretty much just time, the skill that it takes, um, and then just supply and demand. They can only make so many of these, so it has to be charged a little bit more. So there you go. There's some insights. All right. Got a question from Jean Masumi Hara on Twitter. What is the real function of iridium? I have pens here that I reground myself, writing perfectly smooth, juicy, and uniform without any remaining iridium tip. Okay, so yeah, you can grind and polish your untipped nibs to be just as smooth and uniform as if there was tipping on there. Um, that's, that's not really so much the issue. It's not that the tipping, the metal itself, uh, performs so much differently in terms of, of pen feel. You can grind steel, gold, whatever tipping material to be just as smooth as anything else, pretty much. Uh, it's a matter of longevity. So if you're grinding away that tipping material, it's just not going to last as long having a bare stainless steel nib as you would if you had tipping on there. That's pretty much the only reason why it's there. Um, and if you can go back all through history and you can look at all kinds of crazy nib designs and stuff that, that companies came out with um, that had different kinds of tipping or different shaping or all kinds of stuff. There were some that they had called spoon nibs where they literally just like dented the end of a stainless steel nib so that it made sort of a ball. This was like during World War II times where they had like really scarce resources. So they didn't have tipping and all this kind of stuff. So it would literally just like, boom, like punch out a scoop in the end of the nib. They write pretty terribly and have not held up well over the years, but you know, there were all kinds of crazy things tried. And the, the quality of stainless steel, especially decades ago, was not nearly as good as the iridium, you know, really, really dense, hard alloy. Or, well, iridium itself is an element, it's not an alloy, but the alloy that makes up the modern nib tipping. So iridium itself is a really interesting metal. It needs a little bit of explanation. I did some research and uh, I'm not like an iridium expert here and I'm certainly not any kind of chemist. So forgive me if I'm a little bit out of my depth, but maybe I'll at least pique your interest and you can go Wikipedia for yourself. Um, but iridium was first discovered around 1803. Um, it's a very, very dense metal and it's the second densest metal on earth next to osmium, I believe. Uh, it's the ninth rarest stable element in Earth's crust. Uh, platinum is 10 times more abundant than iridium, so it's pretty hard to find. In fact, only about three tons are mined and used each year globally. It's not that much in the grand scheme of things. Um, it is present much higher, actually, in meteorites in outer space. Um, there's just not that much of it native to Earth. And it's speculated that basically meteorites years and millions of years ago that crashed into the Earth uh, have basically given us all the iridium that we have here. Um, so it's, it's almost kind of a byproduct of mining for things like copper and nickel and, and gold and other metals. Um, every now and then they'll find a little bit of iridium and they'll kind of like file it away and keep it um, when they're, they're mining for things that are much easier to actually find. Um, <coughs> these days, uh, iridium is used mostly to create smelting crucibles for other metals um, because iridium itself has an extremely high um, melting point and so it's, it's really good for heating up other metals and, and using them in the smelting process. Um, it's got a very high heat resistance. It's used for like spark plug contacts um, and in a lot of electronic applications, especially in modern day uh, televisions like OLED screens and stuff like that. Um, these days, because of the rarity and the difficulty in actually working the iridium, since it's such a hot, you know, heat resistant metal and, and so dense and all that, um, it's not used all that much in tipping these days. Even though it says iridium point, you know, on a lot of pens, iridium is, is not a, you know, 
it's not like it's 100% rhythm on that tip because there's just not that much of it and it's really hard to weld. So these days I think um, you're seeing either some kind of an alloy. In fact, I've, I've heard loosely throughout the pen industry that maybe only 3% of tipping is actually iridium these days um, because there are so many other good alternatives to it. Um, things like osmium, rhodium, chromium, uh, other hard metals are a little easier to work with, a little more abundant, uh, and so it's not such an impossibly, you know, difficult material to you to find and then work with. Um, so that you're getting, you're getting an alloys that, um, you know, I don't know 100% which tipping has what, it's kind of mysterious and very proprietary within the pen world um, of who uses exactly what tipping. But even talking to nibmeisters, you know, there are major differences in how easy it is to grind certain nibs versus other certain nibs. Um, and in the grinding process, basically all the nibmeisters use diamond wheels because diamond is basically the only thing that will grind these extremely dense metals. So. The basic idea behind everything I'm talking about here is that when you're using some kind of tipping material, it's going to be denser than whatever the stainless steel that you're using. Not that stainless steel is that bad, especially modern stainless steels. If you look at Mohs hardness scale, which if you remember that from your science days, you know, you get things like talc and limestone and stuff like that that are really kind of soft. And then you get things like diamond, which is the hardest, uh, and it's a scale of one to 10 roughly. Uh, and so things like that, you're looking at stainless steel is gonna be somewhere in like five and a half range. And then, you know, iridium is more like a six and a half, okay? And then things like chromium are closer to like an eight uh, or maybe even a nine. So you get, you get up there, like tungsten carbide is a nine. That really gets up there. <clears throat> so you can, uh, you can definitely get a better wear resistance by using a tipping material than you can just with plain stainless steel. Um, but that's, that said, if you look at, for example, stainless steel nibs that have a stub, right? Like most, most stainless steel stub nibs are untipped, right? Pretty much universally, um, partly because the quality of stainless steel has gotten a lot better in recent years. Um, it's very economical to do that as opposed to these like super rare earth metals. Uh, and then also the amount of surface area that there is on a stub nib, the wear is not gonna be as quick as it would be on say like an extra fine or a fine or something like that. Cause it just, it just spreads out the surface area on the page and it's just not gonna wear as quickly. So how much does it matter on some of these other nibs? A little bit. I mean, you can grind away your tipping material or have an untipped nib and you can get a few years of use out of it. What's going to happen? Basically, there's friction on the page. Paper, if you look at it microscopically, paper is actually kind of rough. Um, even kind of smooth paper, you can see it's got divots and there's a lot of friction that's created when you're in the process of writing. And that gives you your feedback, it gives you your feel. Um, and so the, um, the friction that is created when you're writing over a long period of time will actually wear away the metal on the nib. And, and that'll happen with all pens eventually, right? Depends on how much you use it and how regularly and so on. The tipping size, the quality of the tipping material um, will all depend on how long it will last, how much you bear down on it, how fast you write, the size of writing that you have, etc. cetera. Um, if you have untipped steel, then you're gonna get a few years, give or take, <laughs> of good use out of it. And then what's gonna happen is, if you hold your pen kind of in at least roughly the same spot, you're gonna take that, that, that tip, which is relatively rounded, and it's going to start to wear it away wherever the paper is, and you're gonna get kind of a flat spot, which at first won't really be a problem um, until it gets to a certain point, and then that flat spot is going to actually start to create kind of an edge and that's gonna to start to dig into the page and it's gonna feel really scratchy or it's gonna to start to change the shape. It's gonna broaden up your, your nib size and I'm talking like over years of using the same pen. It's gonna broaden up your nib size, it's gonna wear it away a little bit, it's gonna to start to feel scratchier and you're gonna to need to basically re-smooth it, re-grind it out. Which, if you know how to do that already, you know, more power to you. That's something that certainly you're kind of capable of doing, even just micro mesh can help with that um, if you have an untipped nib. Um, but yeah, it's, Still advisable though, if you're in grind, if you're doing any type of grinding yourself, 
try not to grind all the tipping away because especially if it's already there, like just grind a little bit and then leave as much of that tipping as possible because um, you're gonna greatly extend the life of your nib by years, maybe even decades. Uh, by having that tipping on there just because it's a more hard wearing metal than that stainless steel that's on there. Certainly if you have something like gold, uh, you're going to want to leave that tipping on there because gold is softer than steel uh, and certainly softer than the tipping material. So if you're practicing any of your own grinding and you are grinding away the tipping off of a gold nib, I mean it could literally be a matter of a couple of months and you could wear away that spot and create a really scratchy nib. I've seen that happen before and it's not great because then when you need to smooth it out, you're smoothing out and like every few months you're grinding and smoothing and then you're not gonna have much of a nib left after like a year. So I would not advise doing that with a gold nib, but if you wanna do it with a steel, more power to you. Most, most stainless steel nubs, nibs are relatively replaceable, so it's not necessarily the end of the world, but if you have something particularly rare or vintage or whatever, you just wanna be really cognizant of that and try not to grind away any more than you need to uh, because you can't put it back easily, right? Unless you're getting into welding and all that kind of stuff, which is a whole other beast, not easy to do. Cool, okay, goldman dot underscore on Instagram asked, is the Pilot Custom 74 durable? It seems like it's plastic, so I'm hesitant to drop $150 on it. Brian seems to swear by it, but can I drop it? Well, you can drop it. You can do whatever you want. Um, <laughs> I would say just like any other plastic pen, um, it all depends on how you drop it, right? Like if you drop it out of the second story of a parking deck and it lands on asphalt, it's not gonna be good for the pen. Um, if you're dropping it off your desk and it falls onto a carpeted floor, it's really not gonna be a problem. You know, so I would say in most situations, you're going to be okay. I personally have been carrying this one around for about eight years. Not like daily carry, but I do take it with me and use it quite a bit. I've never had a situation that's caused it to crack. That would make me cry because this pen has been with me through so much. Um, but being practical, it could happen. It's plastic, right? Um, now, there is different grades of plastic, and there's certain levels of durability depending on the thickness, the design, how it falls, all et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yes, there's certainly a calculated risk involved when you have a plastic pen, but a lot of what causes a pen to be a, pri a price like this has to do with more than just general durability. It has to do with the nib. It's got a gold nib, very nicely tuned. It's a great writing pen. It's got the cartridge converter filling mechanism, which is a little more expensive on this particular pen, that Con 70. It's got the inner cap. It's got some other nice things going on with it. Uh, that kind of put it in that price range. And it is kind of in that introductory level gold nib pen range. So for gold nib pens, this is more on the more affordable end. Uh, so I wouldn't expect it to be, you know, something I could smash with a hammer necessarily. That gets uh, pretty special. You know, the pen that I'm daily carrying a little bit more uh, is my Homo sapiens, which is made of resin and basaltic lava. This one is a little more durable, okay? Really don't have to worry about dropping this one anywhere. Uh, because it's made of volcano, but it's a $600 plus pen. So there, yes, I would expect a little more durability. But that said, there are plenty of $600 on up pens that are not really any more durable than this thing. So, you know, I think this is, there is a certain kind of mindset, especially in the US with like heavier, more durable, bigger, you equate that with higher quality um, and thus higher price. Uh, it's not necessarily the case, especially with Japanese pens. Japanese pens tend to uh, almost be kind of the opposite. Like the lighter uh, and and I don't wanna say delicate, but the, the ones that are not as, as extra weight and stuff like that actually tend to be um, a little more desirable and evoke of a higher quality. So some of that just depends on cultural norms. Some of that depends on manufacturer's preferences you know, the engineering itself, the types of material that's used, it's, you know, pla all plastic is not created equal. Um, so that's kind of where that comes into play. You know, if you wanted something that was kind of comparable in price range to this, but wanted a little more durability, Pilot Vanishing Point, it's made out of metal, very durable, it's cool. Um, you could certainly go the route of a Lamy 2000, it's polycarbonate, that's really durable. You know, so you have a lot of alternate options. Um, but I still love the Snake Custom 74, and especially because of the way that it writes. 
personally. Um, so I'm not going to try and like hard convince you one way or another. It's, it's really going to be a matter of personal preference. Um, but I will say that I personally was surprised at how much I like writing with the Custom 74. I mean, it's blue, which I love. But even that, um, you know, the overall design of the pen wouldn't necessarily be one that I would immediately gravitate to and be like, yeah, this is the design that I completely desire. But, of course, it means so much to me now. Uh, I think it's a great pen and worth consideration um, for anybody who, who wants a really enjoyable pen. Okay. Ask for Sharon on Twitter says, I have a Noodler's Charlie that I got as a free pen with a bottle of ink, but I can't find any information about it anywhere. It looks similar to a nib creeper, but it's eyedropper only and with a non-flex nib. Any idea where I can go for info about it? Um, you're right. I looked for info about this pen and did not find much of it at all. Um, there is information buried in some of Nathan Tardis' videos. I can't even point you to which one because I couldn't remember. And they're all like 45 minutes long. So uh, that's a fail on my part, but perhaps somewhere in the heart of darkness. Um, one, because that's uh, I think where he first introduced it. But now this is the this is the Charlie pen. So this is the pen that comes in the Noodler's four and a half ounce ink bottles. Nathan went through some iterations of Noodler's pens. Um, he used to have a platinum preppy. There was a phase where he would actually imprint Noodler's ink on it. So I kept this for historical reference. Um, but yeah, it's a Noodler's ink um, eyedropper only preppy. He would actually, Nathan Tardif himself, would take the post out of the preppies so that it could not be used with a cartridge or converter only as an eyedropper, partly because he just hates the idea of disposable cartridges. Welcome to the mind of Nathan Tardif, right? He definitely believes in what he believes in. So he wanted this eyedropper only pen. He used to do that. That was a lot of work. So then he made these pens, which for a free pen, and literally it's free because there used to not be pens included with the four and a half inks, four and a half ounce inks. He started including the pen. He did not raise the price. So really he included the pen for free for you. I mean, there is a, a cost associated with the pen. There's no such thing as a free pen, right? But he didn't, he ate that cost. So don't be thinking that like you're getting ripped off or anything because you're not. I mean, if it works at all, then great, you made a bonus. So here's the pen. It's a clear pen. Because of the type of resin that it is, I don't know why it does this, but it tends to yellow, um, especially when it's up against a black like this. I guess it's just some kind of leaching coloration that happens or something, but this is pretty normal uh, on several of the, the clear Noodler's pens, but this one in particular, when it's up against black like this, um, it's an eyedropper pen. It comes with some silicon grease on it, I believe. I can't remember. This is a super old pen. This is one of the first ones that came out and I kept it. Um, it's got an O-ring on here. It's got an ebonite feed on a free pen, which is crazy. Um, and then a stainless steel Noodler's nib non-flex, like you mentioned, but it's that nib creeper size nib. Um, and then the cap itself is this kind of like rainbow vegetal resin colored uh, cap with a black finial and this chrome clip with Noodler's Inc. logo written on it. So it's actually not a bad looking pen to be quite honest with you and you know I'm not gonna say that like you should buy a four and a half ounce ink just to get this pen and then consider it free ink because really the ink is what you're paying. A four and a half ounces of ink it's huge it's like a lot of ink um, but it's, it's really not a bad pen so we don't have a whole ton of information on this pen really because you can't buy just the pen. It only comes with the ink. But you know, now that I'm thinking about it, it's something that like maybe we can include a little more information on the product pages for those inks that talk about the Charlie pen. I think what happened is he introduced the pen. There was some buzz about it. People were talking about it. And then we kind of stopped talking about it and stopped putting out stuff and just over time, it's just not been talked about as much. So we need to maybe revisit that again. It's kind of got me thinking a little bit like, okay, could we do a better job of describing what it is? And you know, maybe have dimensions or something because it's not a standalone pen. We don't have like all the dimensions and things that we would normally have on like a pen on our product pages. Um, but there it is. So it's a small pen. You're right. It's very similar to the Nib Creeper. Um, in fact, the Nib Creeper when it first came out was not a flex pen. Um, it was a standard issue pen. Uh, and so with a, a, what he called a fine medium nib. It's basically the same width as what you would have on the Noodler's Nib Creeper, uh, the same tipping size, uh, just not in a non-flexible version. 
So overall, it's a fairly reliable pen. Some people don't like it. It burps on them or whatever. It's got an M&I feed, so you can heat set it and you can mess with it a little bit if you want. But most people, they consider it like a free pen if they ink it up and it doesn't work great for them right off the bat. They basically will just kind of write it off or, or whatever um, and not really spend too much time investigating what's going on. And that's fine. You know, I also imagine the, the QC on a pen like this is not going to be the same as one that you've, you know, intentionally paid just for the pen itself. But it's a decent little pen. Um, I've had people that swear it off and think it's a piece of junk. I've had other people that literally have told me that it's their favorite pen and they use it every single day. Go figure. Um, but I think it's at least trying if you're already interested in a Needler's four and a half ounce ink and it has that Charlie pen to go with it, maybe give it a shot. All right. The Green Tea Cat on Instagram says, Hey, Brian, I have several nice fountain pens, and I absolutely love them, but I'm having a hard time using them because I'm afraid I'm going to break them. I feel like there's so much to look out for when using fountain pens to make sure that they last a long time, and so I'm constantly worried about making a serious mistake. Do you have any suggestions for getting over this fear? I really want to not be afraid of using my pens. Thanks for all you do for the fountain pen community. Well, green tea cat, hopefully I can help you out here today. This is going to be a very personal kind of comfort level thing. And I think everybody's got a different threshold. You know, with some pens, we talked a little bit about durability of the Custom 74 and, and you know, free pens that come with ink and stuff like that. There's a wide range of pens that you can have. So you really have a lot of options here. Um, I personally uh, am relatively practical when it comes to my pen usage. Uh, I do have a few pens that get rather pricey, and I will be a little hesitant about bringing them into certain situations, the Mikis and these types of things, um, because when you get into a certain dollar range, it's like, okay, probably nothing's going to happen if I take it somewhere, but uh, if it did, that would be really bad, and uh, that would suck, and so I don't want to do that. Uh, other pens, it's like, oh yeah, Pilot Metropolitan, like, I'm just going to beat that thing up, because I pretty much can't really hurt it. Um, it's going to be different for everybody. And I don't know which pens exactly that you have, so which ones you're kind of afraid about uh, using. But in general, I'll go ahead and summarize first at the beginning. Uh, just use your pens, please, because that's what they're made for. <laughs> Especially the fountain pens, a lot of the ones that we're carrying, you know, we do have some limited edition, like really nice kind of collector grade stuff. But like, there's a reason why you have an ink splatter as our logo, because like, we want to promote the usage of fountain pens and kind of dispel the whole idea that there's a status associated with it or that, you know, it has to be a certain a panache or something like that. Like, nah, like ink them up, use them, get your hands messy, you know, beat them up a little bit. Like that's okay. Um, in my eyes at least, but everybody's got a different threshold. Uh, I literally know some people, some customers that uh, will buy a Namiki Emperor $10,000 pen, uh, ink it right up on the spot, and then daily carry it every day, just like in their shirt pocket. And they're totally cool with that, and they do that all the time, and they don't think twice. Other people are really hesitant um, to even buy a pen over like a Twisby Go price because they will say that they either lose their pens a lot or they're just very clumsy and they don't want to break and damage it and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I totally get that too. I think the comfort level is going to differ for everybody. Some pens are a little more delicate than others. Um, and so they're going to be handled with special consideration. You know, I think especially if you have some, um, you know, particular resin pens and things like that, if you work in an environment where you're a mechanic or you're, uh, you know, machinist or something and you're working on heavy machinery and if you drop the pen and it gets rolled over by a heavy cart and it could really damage it a lot that would be really bad if you had something expensive like a platinum 3776 or something like that that might be a situation where something like a lamy safari would be a really good situation to be in um, or something like twisby goes much more affordable more replaceable or a more durable pen like a pet pilot metropolitan that's made of metal and okay yeah Maybe if you drop it in, you know, uh, a gravel parking lot and a car drives over it, it might get scratched, but it's still going to write and it's still going to function. So um, it all depends on just kind of what your situation is um, based on what your job is and where you plan on taking it. 
Um, me personally, I carry my pens around when I have them on my person, I'll carry it around like a leather sleeve like this. This does a whole lot to protect it, um, a leather slip like this. Um, so certainly you can go the route of having you know, that type of sleeve or um, like a rickshaw sleeve, something like that can protect pens really well. And this literally, I'll just throw it in my pocket. And, and I've been doing this for three years with this pen and it's been great. Um, when I'm carrying my pens around, I carry them around in my backpack and I, I throw my backpack around everywhere. Um, so I'll have, you know, like a harder case like this with slots, you know, individual slots that um, I have that keep all the pens separated. So that helps a lot. Uh, and it's just a general cognizance that I have around some of the pens that I have. Granted, I'm, I live in the pen world, so I know what the value is and how easy it is to replace and all that, like at a glance. But you know, if you have a smaller, smaller collection than what I have to, do, to keep track of, uh, it probably wouldn't be too hard for you to keep track of either. You know, you might have a, a three pen case that you like to carry around that's got all your, your banger on pens, you know, your workhorses, if you will. And then your nicer ones you keep at your desk and all that. But um, aside from like really being active and tossing your pens around, just regular use, you know, you really don't have to worry too much. The pens are designed to be used, specifically if you're talking about, you know, pens that come from manufacturers that have been around a really long time. Your Pilots, your Lamy's, you know, if you're talking decades old or centuries old companies, um, then they, they know what they're doing. They know how to design these things to be written with for a long time and be used and enjoyed for a long time. And I think you, um, it's really just a, a mental thing you have to get over to say, okay, even if something happens with this pen, it's, it's worth the risk because I wanna actually write with it and enjoy it. So I would start small, start with a more affordable pen, something that you're more comfortable with um, of just using regularly. And then just as your comfort level increases, try using nicer and nicer pens. Don't carry them around with you as much, but just keep them in a safe place at a desk or whatever. Take care of them, put them in a case or something. Um, and then as your comfort level gets higher and higher, adjust. But please use your pens. I mean, that's, that's what they're for. Um, and I think that you will, uh, you'll make the creators happy because I think uh, most manufacturers really love it when people actually write with the pens. <laughs> um, but also you'll, just, you'll be enjoying your own investment that you have too. Cool, all right, well I hope that helps you out. I got one last question, I'm gonna take another swig of water because I am just like really thirsty today. I don't know what it is. Sarah M on Facebook says, how do pens end up on your bottom shelf? Are they pens that you guys tested or returns or something else? Um, so this is good timing. And actually I took this question because just in the last week or two, we've been talking internally here at Goulet about the bottom shelf. What, it, you know, the bottom shelf is something that we created a long time ago. It's evolved somewhat in its use and like we like to do every now and then. We like to question some of the things that we've been doing for a very long time because context changes over time and stuff just kind of evolves and you know we'll have team members that'll come and train somebody else and then they'll leave and then they'll train somebody else and then you know eventually it's like people don't even remember the origin of why something was the way that it was and that was the situation with bottom shelf. So the bottom shelf actually started before Rachel and I had hired anybody else. So it was really just like me and Rachel in our roots. And it actually was started in the first year when we were in business, before we even had pens. So originally why we created the bottom shelf is because we would receive paper and ink shipments where there would be ink that would maybe have a little bit of leaking on the cap or the box would get crunched or something. And it's just a lot of back and forth to go back with our distributor or manufacturer, try to work out a credit or send it back to them or whatever. It's a lot of time on both ends for just a couple of notebooks or a bottle of ink or something. And it was like, you know what? Some people would probably still find value. You know, if there's a notebook, like what would happen sometimes is we would have a pack of notebooks somewhere along the line, whether it was manufacturer, distributor, or UPS, whoever would use a utility knife and cut open the box, or maybe we cut open the box. And so there's like a knife slash across the front cover of the notebook that was on top of the box. You know, anybody who works in retail, you know, stuff like this happens all the time. We try to be careful, but who knows along the line where, so sometimes we receive something and we're like, ah, there's a big knife slash across the cover. 
And it's like, okay, it's an $8 notebook. Are we gonna go back and forth and spend an hour coordinating? We're not gonna ship it back. It doesn't make any sense. So we're like, we have this notebook. It's got one little knife slash of like a Rhodia pad, you know, for example. I'm gonna pull you up a Rhodia pad. So we would have a, a Rhodia pad, you know, say like this one. We'd have a knife slash across the front of it. And then you'd be like, well, it's obviously not new. I wouldn't want to receive that notebook like that. But I know that whoever receives this notebook, they're gonna fold it over like this. And then they're never even gonna see the front cover, probably. If they're like me, I just leave the pad on my desk. So it's like, it's still got value. All the paper is still perfectly good. What do we do with this thing? So we created the section called the bottom shelf. And the idea was, it's kind of like, you know, top shelf, you know, liquor or whatever. And then bottom shelf is kind of like the stuff that's not as good a quality and you expect a better price and all that. So that was the idea was that the stuff that is cosmetically compromised in some fashion, but still a usable product, we would discount it, put it in a special place on the site. Somebody would get a deal. They would understand that we would describe in the best way that we could, whatever the defect was. And then voila, it goes, they're happy. Our vendor's happy. We're happy. Everybody wins, right? Um, so as long as there's not like too much stuff going in there, <laughs> but anyway, so it was, it was a great solution. And what happened over time, as we started to get into pens and all types of other things, you know, we would get situations where we'd have a pen that would arrive and you know, the, the whole box would fall off the truck. And so the box would be all crunched and banged in. The pen itself was perfectly fine, but maybe the packaging was messed up, uh, or something. So it could be that that could be a situation where a pen might've made it into there. Um, it could be a situation where we get a pen in and I don't know, we've had, sometimes we've had a pen where like the nib is misstamped. <laughs> That's pretty rare, but we've had that happen before. We've had it where there's some kind of cosmetic flaw on the pen itself, which is kind of disappointing. And we always try to communicate that with the manufacturer, but it happens from time to time. Um, and so if that situation, or there's like parts missing out of the box or, or something like that, it could be coming new like that. Um, and so we try to inspect that and, and list anything there that's in that situation. Uh, or sometimes we might have a return coming back from a customer. That's where it gets a little stickier um, because basically anything that's, that's ever been sold to somebody, uh, we don't consider it new anymore. So we won't list anything back on the site at a full price if it's ever been sold, if it's, if it's not in absolutely brand new condition. So if the pen's ever been inked or anything like that, any sign of usage whatsoever, unless it's basically like in completely brand new condition, we're not going to sell it as new again. So even if we get a return and, you know, they say they've never inked it or whatever, we'll thoroughly inspect it to make sure that that's the case. Um, but if there's any evidence, because believe it or not, people lie and they'll say, I never inked the pen. And then you pull out the converter and it's like, the ink is like pouring out of the thing and you're like, you're lying. Anyway, that doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Anybody who's in retail, you know, that kind of thing happens. Um, but we always inspect that kind of thing for that to happen. So we're, we're very diligent about things like returns. Um, if there's, you know, any type of like manufacturing defect and stuff like that, that will always work with the manufacturer uh, or the distributor to kind of work through that. But if we have a pen, sometimes we have a pen, it works perfectly fine, but somebody's like, I really wanted a fine instead of a medium. Can I exchange it? Can I do whatever? And once we work it all out, you know, we may be left with a pen that is perfectly fine, perfectly usable. It's just been inked before. So that's the kind of thing that we might list on the bottom shelf. After we clean it out and inspect it and test it and everything and make sure that it writes great, we might then list it on the bottom shelf just because it's been used before. Or like, for example, if somebody buys a Pilot Custom 823, which comes with a bottle of ink, and then they return the pen, but guess what? They kept the ink or they've used the ink or something like that. Okay, we're not gonna sell that as new anymore. That would go into the bottom shelf. So that kind of thing may be happening. Um, it could be a pen that like I've had to use for the nib nook, or it could be a pen that we've wanted to photograph and we want to show it with ink in it. It's a demonstrator pen. We want to show it with ink in it. Usually most of those I'll keep, but <laughs> if I already have it, then we might be like, okay, we'll list in the bottom shelf or something like that. So, um, you know, it could be any number of situations. We try to, the ones that are most time consuming or most diligent about are the ones that are a return. Um, and usually we'll, we'll state pretty clearly what's going on with the pen. If it's like gently used, then that means basically we've inspected it. It has been used before and we have a, you know, a period of, of, of time where there's not going to be any substantial wear and tear on the pen, you know, in the time period that we'll take a return, um, kind of for that reason. 
But then, um, you know, if there's like a cosmetic flaw in the pen, we'll always try to describe what it is. Um, if it's gently used, but otherwise a, basically a brand new pen, we'll pretty much say that. Um, so that's where you can you can know that it was like either right tested for something like a nib nook or, or you know used for some kind of social media purpose or whatever, um, or it was a very very gently used return that we've thoroughly inspected and then it goes onto the bottom shelf. So basically, if you're ever buying a pen from us on the bottom shelf that says basically you know gently used but otherwise fine. Um, you're pretty much getting a brand new pen, uh, unless there's anything else like bottle is missing or something like that. And we'll usually discount accordingly. Kind of our stock price is, is we'll discount 10% off whatever it is, you know, whatever the, the selling price was. Um, and we may go deeper depending on if there's missing packaging or missing other parts. That we don't often get as much on the pen side of things. Um, but we've really debated like in those situations where we have basically a perfectly good pen that just has been inked before. You know, so we can't sell it as new, but it goes into the bottom shelf. Great, you're getting a discount, you're getting a deal. Is bottom shelf really the right term for that? Because again, almost 10 years ago when we called something bottom shelf, it was because like it actually was damaged and flawed and it just wasn't the same product as something new. Well, these pens that we've tested and stuff like that, they're basically just as good as if you bought a new pen. In some cases, um, you know, we may have, have have actually you know, inked it up and tested it, which we don't do for every pen, of course, um, but we may have inked it up and tested it, so we may even have more confidence that it's gonna be a pen that you're happy with. Um, but, you know, putting in something called the bottom shelf makes it sound like it's guaranteed to be a worse product. So we've really debated about like, is this really the best way to describe this pen? And uh, it's still kind of an open discussion right now, honestly, which is why I wanted to take this question in Q&A and kind of put this out there for you all. We've debated about, should we just change the name bottom shelf? You know, because every, every company, we looked at, you know, a lot of other retailers and what they call it. You know, everybody's got kind of a different name for it. Um, some people call it clearance, some people call it, um, I'm trying to remember what everybody's was, but basically everybody has something different. Um, I think we might be the only ones that call it bottom shelf. Uh, but. Uh, it's really, um, it's really something that we're debating right now. Um, a more appropriate term probably would be something more like open box or pre-owned or something like that. Um, and we debated about like, maybe we should split it out, like keep the bottom shelf maybe because it's, you know, nine or 10 years of, of brand equity in that name. And people, a lot of people know what that means. Um, not everybody, but some people. Uh, and so we could keep that for like cosmetically flawed stuff, but then maybe have like open box or something for these pens that kind of fall in this category, since pens probably make up the majority of what ends up being in the bottom shelf these days. Um, but then we're like splitting things out and we have two different places for you to look at things. So I don't know, we're really, we're really tied up about that one, we're really debating. You know, we like having everything in one place that kind of fits this like gently used or cosmetically flawed place. Maybe it could just be a more robust description that we have within the bottom shelf to explain what it all is in there and then more robust descriptions in the products themselves to explain whether it's like a pre-owned or open box or something like that. Um, probably that needs to happen anyway. Um, or we could, we could split it out, I don't know. Um, right now I think we've decided to keep it as it is, just keep it bottom shelf, explain more in the product descriptions of those bottom shelf items, um, and then kind of maybe revisit it um, and just keep thinking of bottom shelf as maybe the appropriate name uh, for that. But since we're here, since I'm shooting Q&A, I'll go ahead and ask for your feedback. So if you just leave it in the comments or if you wanna shoot our team any feedback, um, that kind of thing is helpful to know. Uh, because Again, we're here to serve you, so whatever makes sense to you and whatever terms you're familiar with and is the clearest to communicate the status of a given product, um, then that really makes sense. And we wanna do that. <laughs> All right, my question of the week this week, this one is gonna be a very interesting kind of deep one, okay? My question of the week is, if you were offered a pen that allowed you to write out premonitions of the future, but you couldn't control what it was that you wrote, would you want it? So this means it could be really good premonitions like next week's lottery numbers or maybe uh, a terrible disaster that's going to happen or something uh, you find out you have cancer or you have something crazy. You don't get to choose what it is. Would you want to know? Basically, it's a kind of twist on the question of if you could, 
know the future? Would you want to know it? Or if you could know when you're going to die, would you want to know it? That kind of thing. So that's my question of the week. Getting weird, getting deep, getting hypothetical. Would you want to own a premonition pen? And then I'm doing a writing prompt. Andy asked me last week, she was like, you know what? You haven't done a writing prompt in a while. Why'd you stop that? It was cool. And I was like, well, I stopped it because I ran out of ideas. <laughs> and I wanted to see if anybody would notice and ask me for it. And there you go. Andy asked me. I haven't done one since like November of last year. I think it was episode 238 or something was the last one that I did. But anyway, here's your writing prompt for this week. Write about the best accomplishment that you've had so far in 2019. This writing prompt is for you to actually pick up your pen and write with paper. You don't have to share it with anybody, but just do it for yourself. What's the best accomplishment you've had in 2019? That's all I got for this week. Again, I'm taking next week off, so uh, I apologize about that, but life will go on, I'm sure. Um, it'll be 4th of July next week. That is also part of why I'm taking off and, and all that, but um, we're, our office is going to be closed on 4th of July. So, uh, yeah, I hope you have a great uh, fourth, if you happen to be in the U.S. or if you just feel like celebrating that day. Um, be sure to like, comment, subscribe. Check out most of what I talked about here on goodlypens.com. Thanks so much for sticking with me on today's Q&A and right on.